Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Felicia Caffinigri, the Acting Director of International and Graduate Programs at Notre Dame Law School in the United States. It's such a pleasure to welcome you all to this great event. Uh, we have our LLM programs at Notre Dame, which offer concentrations in business and tax law, real estate and environmental law, fundamentals of American private law, and intellectual property law. And events such as these give us the opportunity to spotlight the expertise of our faculty and the great work of our alumni among which, of course, are lawyers from Brazil, from Brazil, which we regularly welcome to our LLM programs. And so I am so happy to thank Mateus Lima, a 2019 graduate of our LLM program for moderating today. And of course, to thank uh, our faculty, Professor Roger Alford and Professor Sadie Blanchard for lending their expertise, as well as a member of our Notre Dame network, Dr. Krina Valtag. Of course, Notre Dame's presence in Brazil extends to our Sao Paulo Global Center. And with that, I will, turn uh, the uh, word to Thais Pires from our Global Center in Sao Paulo. Bom dia a todos, bem-vindos. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. I'm uh, Assistant Director of the Sao Paulo Global Center in Sao Paulo, that's part of Notre Dame International. And we are here in Brazil to uh, promote programs from Notre Dame, welcome students and collaboration with Brazilian universities. So thank you for being here. Now, Mateus, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Caponigri. Thank you, Thais. My name is Mateus Lima. Uh, as it was said, I'm a Notre Dame LLM alum. And I have today, I have the honor to, to host the, this meeting for great professors and professionals who I greatly admire and who I had the, the privilege to, to, to watch their classes while, while I was uh, a student in Notre Dame. Before we begin, I would like just to say a quick, uh, quick thank you to some organizations who helped us share and devote this event. Uh, first, the uh, the arbitration committee of the Sao Paulo chapter of the Brazilian Bar Association and the ba Bahia chapter of the, the arbitration committee too. And the CJA, CJA, the Younger Arbitralist Committee, who also helped us very much to share. And the NEA, Núcleo de Estudos em Arbitragem do Norte, the, which which have been doing great work in the northern part of Brazil in spreading arbitration and have been a great help in, in divulging the sharing this event and spreading arbitration throughout the, the whole country. And now that, that, that we, we concluded that, uh, I'll have the, the pleasure of introducing our our first speaker, we will begin with Professor Krina Baltag. Professor Baltag is uh, currently a lecturer at Stockholm University and has great knowledge and experience with arbitration in Brazil because of her great work ahead of AMCHAM, uh, the AMCHAM Arbitration Chamber here in Brazil. And she, she will be talking about arbitration, international arbitration in Brazil more specifically. So please, everyone, uh, receive Professor Baltag. Thank you very much, uh, Mateus. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. I'm uh, truly grateful for the cooperation between Stockholm University and Notre Dame, and in particular, grateful to the friendship uh, with Professor Roger Arford and Professor Sadie Blanchard. Um, and uh, it's a sort of going back to uh, a, a dear home uh, to me. As Mateo said, I spent uh, quite many years in Brazil uh, uh, at the head of the Amcham Arbitration and Mediation Center. And of course, I had uh, the privilege to interact with the arbitration community, uh, as well as with the uh, decision makers and the think tanks in Brazil. And uh, uh, this kind of merges to a very dear topic to me, which is investment arbitration. Um, and the first question is, why do we discuss investment arbitration in Brazil? Uh, you'll hear in a few seconds why uh, and why this is relevant to all of us. Um, so I have the 
a pleasure to introducing the investment arbitration landscape in Brazil uh, in 10 minutes. Uh, that would not be difficult because I think we should focus on two main issues. The first one is the Brazil's accession to relevant international conventions and Brazil's bilateral policy with respect to protection and pr promotion of foreign direct investments. The second point is Brazil's domestic framework relevant to foreign investors. Um, I will focus more on the first one. Uh, and I'm sure that most of you are aware that Brazil is not a contracting state to the Convention on the Settlement of uh, Investment Disputes between states and nationals of other states, or in short, exit convention under the auspices of the World Bank. Uh, but Brazil is in a good company because it's not the only contracting states with a notable absence. Uh, India is another one. And of course, uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Bo Bolivia, which denounced the exit convention in the 2000. Um, also interesting is to point out that only in 2002, Brazil ratified the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. Now, we know that Brazil is part of Mercosur, uh, and more recently, uh, in, uh, within the Mercosur, we have the Intra-Mercosur Investment Facilit Facilitation Protocol. And of course, Brazil has signed in 1990s the convention establishing the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. Now, going back to the core uh, discussion, um, Brazil, of course, has no bilateral investment treaty uh, in force uh, with other countries. Um, during the 90s, Brazil has negotiated um, and signed about 14 BITs with Portugal, UK, Switzerland, Finland, Italy, Denmark, France, Venezuela, Korea, Germany, Cuba, the Netherlands, and Bel Belgo Luxembourg Economic Union. None of this ratified. Uh, and as far as I know, six of these 14 BITs uh, made their way to the Brazilian Congress for approval, but later, later withdrawn uh, um, during the discussion stages. Now, my understanding is that while this was debated uh, in the Congress, uh, there were at least two uh, important uh, points raised. The first one, the investor state dispute resolution mechanism, uh, an issue with that, and we'll probably hear more about this, and the interpretation of domestic laws and policies by an arbitral tribunal. So these were not very good positive uh, uh, points on the agenda for the legislator. Now, throughout the years, uh, of course, there are some forms of cooperation uh, memoranda uh, signed by Brazil, including with Singapore, in a way to um, enhance, promote investments, but not in a form of a bilateral investment treaty. Now, what is important to note that as we're in the 1990s and no BITs, uh, obviously Brazil starts to build its profile within the BRICS countries, and of course to reassess its position in Latin America and rebuild its cooperation with Latin American states. Uh, and what is interesting, there is a shift to some extent from a, a capital importing to a capital exporting status of Brazil. And if I just mention a few uh, names of, of uh, Brazilian companies, you'll probably realize why uh, this shift. Uh, vale, Petrobras, Odebrecht, forgetting the corruption scandal, uh, Embraer, Banco do Brasil. These are a few of the successful Brazilian companies uh, who managed to uh, establish successful investments abroad. So while we, we can look at the statistics and see, for example, in 2016, that Brazil was one of the uh, top 10 uh, largest GDP uh, economies in the world uh, that succeeded to be uh, in the top 10 without a BIT concluded, it did face some internal pressure to address uh, the investor, Brazilian investors' protection abroad. And in fact, it is interesting that in 2013, there was an empirical research that was coordinated by the Brazilian National Industry Confederation. So directly asking the users or uh, those affected the Brazilian investors, what would be the top priority for 
um, the government, Brazilian government. And one of the top requests was to consider uh, concluding bilateral investment treaties with countries receiving Brazilian investments. Now, it is also interesting to mention in this context that the fact that Brazil had no bilateral investment treaty concluded did not prevent, obviously, the Brazilian investors going abroad. Um, and we do have um, some successful cases in which Brazilian investors prevailed, uh, but uh, they did so by way of establishing um, represent well companies, branches in, uh, in third states. And a good example is the Netherlands, where, for example, Petrobras has his uh, its uh, BV, and there was all, there was an arbitration involving Petrobras uh, Netherlands. So one would say, by way of uh, corporate restructuring, treaty shopping, uh, Brazilian investors uh, gain access to uh, the other to other bilateral investment treaties. Now, I I will not go into my a detailed opinion why there is no uh, um, bilateral investment treaty arrangement pursued by Brazil, but I can speculate uh, in addition to the two points that I, I made before, before the Brazilian Congress that perhaps there are some peculiarities of Brazil that would um, prevent or maybe make things a bit difficult in entering into disagreements. The first one is the federalist system. Uh, and uh, for somebody who lives in Brazil, I, I don't think there is anything to be added, but uh, uh, I think this is one of the main points uh, that has to be taken into consideration. The second one is uh, in particular with reference to ICSID. Um, World Bank um, and World Bank institutions are not that popular in Latin America. So maybe, maybe there is something uh, uh, derived from that. Uh, third, um, Brazil has a different approach to um, settling disputes in a way. Uh, there is more focus on uh, diplomacy. There is actually successful diplomacy uh, that one can point out in this matrix. And of course, this is also reflect reflected in some subsequent developments that I'll mention in a second. I would also mention the recognition and enforcement of ICSID awards. Um, as we know as own court judgments, and this is where some reluctance might um, uh, be reflected in the lack of bilateral investment treaties. In any case, uh, what is interesting is that uh, starting with 2015, uh, Brazil started signing uh, cooperation and facilitation investment agreements. Um, and up to date, there are such agreements with Chile, Colombia, Malawi, Mexico, Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Suriname, and the latest one with uh, India signed on 25th of January, 2020. To this, we can add the economic and trade expansion agreement with Peru. So what are these um, cooperation and facilitation investment agreements? First of all, they're not bilateral investment treaties. Um, not in the traditional sense. Uh, they have, um, let's say, a new approach to the substantive standards for the protection of investments, uh, national treatment, uh, most favored nation tr treatment, or even absence of that, for instance, most uh, favored nation treatment standard in the, the agreement with India, uh, it's not there at all, uh, expropriation, uh, for example, the agreement with Suriname um, uh, covers only direct expropriation. It covers only, these agreements cover only foreign direct investment. And the dispute resolution provisions are uh, not the ones that we, found, we find in the traditional bilateral investment treaties. Uh, there is a, a two-tier system uh, that focuses on states, so the parties to the, to the agreement and not investor state dispute resolution settlement. Uh, in the first year, investors have access to the ombudsman uh, that is established in each uh, contracting state, uh, which is, uh, as, as Brazil has mentioned, is, uh, is an inspiration from the Korea's uh, Office of Investment Ombudsman. And uh, uh, the second year is a joint committee where well, only parties, so the states, have access to this uh, uh, mechanism. But in essence, there is no ISDS uh, mechanism available. 
Now, so just briefly on the second part, because I probably am, I'm, I'm running out of minutes. Um, this is the current situation of, of uh, Brazil in relation to investments uh, and protection and promotion of investments. The question is, what is put in place at the domestic level in Brazil? I will not go in too much into detail, but um, uh, of course, Brazil has a arbitration law, uh, quite successful, um, which was amended in 2015. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we see that courts at least uh, and the legislator approaches um, uh, arbitration as, an, as a, an alternative to courts in a very proactive and favorable manner. So perhaps what we can see from here is um, in a way uh, uh, an approach that investors do have some uh, opportunities uh, at the national level in Brazil. I will stop here and of course uh, I'll, I'll get back to this uh, to this points later in the conversation. Thank you professor for the for the great speech and uh, I'm sure at the end we'll have time to address all these outstanding points. Um, so uh, for our, our second speaker, we will have Professor Sadie Blanchard, whom uh, I had the pleasure to, to be her student while I, I was a, an LLM student. Uh, professor Blanchard is a professor at the Notre Dame Law School and has experience in investment arbitration. Uh, she worked at the, at the, the Paris practice of King's Spalding and at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal and was a fellow at the Max Planck Institute on International Procedural Law in Luxembourg. Uh, thank you, Professor Blanchard. Thank you, Mateus, and thank you, Prina, um, for that really interesting. I have some questions, but maybe we can get to those <laughs> later. Um, so I am uh, going to talk about uh, some of the critiques of investor state arbitration. There are many, we don't have time to talk about all of them, but we'll talk about a few of them. Um, some of the reform proposals that have been put forward and that are, um, some of them at least are being actively discussed and debated in a, um, in a working group uh, among uh, representatives of, of different states in UNCITRAL, and that's the UN um, Committee on International Trade um, law. So there's this discussion of, of how and uh, how to reform to, uh, investor state arbitration to address these concerns. And, um, and I'll give sort of my thoughts about, about reform briefly, all of that in 10 minutes. Um, all right, so let's start with critiques. I can't talk about all of them, but I will talk about some that I think have been sort of the most um, commonly discussed and discussed for the longest time. Um, the first is um, does this even work, right? So the whole reason that states give uh, foreign investors the, these rights to bring uh, claims is um, in the hope that it will increase foreign investment. Now, Karina pointed out um, that, that states might have a different view about this depending on whether they're capital importing or capital exporting. Um, and so if, if it's a capital importing state, they um, uh, you know, presumably are more concerned about whether this is gonna help them attract more foreign investment. If it's a, a capital exporting state, then um, the question is um, we're concerned about protecting uh, potentially our own uh, companies when they're operating abroad. Um, so does it, does it increase inbound investment? Um, it's hard to establish empirically um, whether giving investors this right um, increases foreign investment or not, because you can't do randomized control trials to, to figure it out. Um, there are a lot of different factors that affect um, um, how attractive a country is to foreign investment, including the resources and opportunities that are available in that country, what the regulatory and governmental environment is like, what the ports are like. And a lot of those factors are correlated with whether or not a state tends to say yes to investment um, arbitration or not. So it's hard to know what's really doing the work. Um, there's been a lot of empirical research uh, trying to figure this out. And it really comes out 
um, both ways. So you have some studies finding that this helps, you have others finding it doesn't. The most rigorous studies that really do the work of trying to control for all of the other factors suggests that it helps sometimes, right? So um, it's kind of intuitive. It helps um, for countries that have a real um, reputation problem with foreign investors. They're seen as being very politically risky and investors are comforted by, uh, by having the right to go to an international tribunal if they have a problem. Um, all right, so another a sort of related point is, so investor state arbitration can be expensive. If a, claim, if a claim is brought, it can be expensive to defend against it and the damages awards can be really large. And so if we don't know whether it's helping or not, whether it's giving us more investment or better investment or you know, investment at a lower cost, then maybe we wanna look um, for other solutions and uh, such as the sort of diplomatic protection model um, that Brazil has uh, favored, which Karina talked about. Um, and so maybe, maybe we have different ways to do this that are more cost effective and, and work just as well. I guess one counterpoint I would make uh, a concern about diplomatic protection is that it's going to tend to help uh, large investors more than small investors. Um, large investors that can um, that are important enough <laughs> for the state to really invest resources in helping. Um, it, it's so unlike where where if you're a small investor, um, um, you have an you sort of have an absolute right to initiate an arbitration. Right, you can make you can you make the arbitration happen by requesting it. Uh, there seems to be more opportunity for states to kind of stall, delay, ignore if they're going through um, like a more bureaucratic process. Um, right, so another critique that is um, raised often is the argument that agreeing to investor state arbitration will ch chill regulation. Um, the fear is that giving these foreign investors the right to bring claims sort of coupled with sort of the breadth and some people say the vagueness of the way that treaties um, the protections of foreign investors in these treaties um, are worded. So you have protections like, you know, the investor needs to be treated fairly and equitably. So that could mean potentially a lot of different things, um, but this is gonna make regulators afraid to do their jobs. Um, so again, the question is evidence. It's really hard to know whether this is happening. Um, in fact, there's really no, no, no good evidence about it. Um, there's this one interesting case study that a woman did who had worked in the government in Canada around the time that uh, the first investment claims hit Canada and those were challenging sort of some of the ways that the environmental regulators had um, interacted with these foreign investors. And so what she found um, was that it didn't, it didn't chill regulation, right? It, so what it did was it um, like the changes that were made in the regulatory process were to make sure that sort of due process was being afforded, that the regulators were following their own rules um, and following the laws, but they, they weren't afraid to uh, regulate. There were a lot of new regulations that were passed around the same time. Now that's one case and that's Canada and who knows how generalizable that is, um, but it is a concern that a lot of people have. Uh, all right, so one more. Um, critique is that the decisions are sometimes inconsistent. Um, and that I think follows from the point about the breadth of some of the, um, the language in the treaties. Um, it leaves a lot of room for uh, interpreting uh, the obligations in different ways. And there's no formal system of controlling precedent and there's no appellate body, right? To sort of, uh, to, to help create a coherent body of law. Um, in some ways, it's not surprising that cases come out differently because the treaties are different, right? There are thousands of different treaties that are being interpreted, but you do have some situations where the same treaty um, is being interpreted on very similar facts and coming out in different ways. And that's a concern that people have. So what can you do or what are some of the things that are um, being suggested to address some of these problems? Again, there are too many to mention. And if you're interested in learning more, the UNSACHAL working group that's looking at this has a really great website with, all, with um, sort of minutes of all of the discussions and they're broken down by the different topics and reform proposals 
um, that have been put forth. But um, so one, one proposal, and I'll raise this because Karina mentioned it as particularly relevant to Brazil, is to prevent treaty shopping. And so that might be something that Brazil might oppose. I don't know actually what their position is on this, but if they are kind of wanting to be in a situation where their own investors are protected abroad, but they don't have to worry about being subject to claims by foreign investors in Brazil, then they want maybe their investors to be able to treaty shop and go set up um, shop in um, the Netherlands and get the advantage without sort of reciprocating it. Um, but so that's something that some, some countries are talking about wanting to stop. Um, another proposal, I would say like maybe it's, I would call it a category of proposals, um, would be something like um, tighter and maybe more centralized control of who can be an arbitrator. And this is justified by different, um, by different arguments, one being that it might help uh, in, increase coherence and consistency and maybe correctness. Another is that like some people are concerned that arbitrators are biased. So sort of a, a way that this might look in practice is to change the way that arbitrators in ICSID, let's say, which Karina mentioned, can be um, selected. So instead of allowing investors to choose anybody they want, subject of course to conflict and um, ethics requirements and the state's objection in the particular arbitration, you have a closed list and arbitrators can only choose from this closed list. and the and who is on that list is decided by the member states of ICSID. Um, and then, okay, so I'll just, I'll, I'll stop there be, uh, on what the pro reform proposals are because I'm running out of time and we can um, talk about some of the other ones and Q and A if you're interested. Um, I'll just give a brief, brief assessment of, of how the, these reforms should happen. So this is an issue whether to give in foreign investors the right to bring these claims that's really contested. And it's something that implicates really core political values of different states. And the fact is that different countries have different needs and different strengths, and there's no single model that is right for every country, okay? And this isn't the kind of issue like climate change, like addressing climate change that means, that requires everybody to sort of get on board and agree to do the same kinds of things. It's very much an issue in which every state can decide for itself um, how much foreign investment it wants and how it wants to go about trying to attract that foreign investment. And so what that means is that reforms should be done in a way that preserves a wide spectrum of options for states, ranging from the option to make a really strong, credible commitment um, on the international level to foreign investors, um, to the option to just opt out entirely of international protection. Of course, there's customary international law protections against expropriation without appropriate compensation. But after that, um, really, it should be up to each country. And thank you very much. And I will stop there, even though I would like to say a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blanchard. Uh, yeah, I, I know the feeling that of what did you cover everything, but it was a, a great speech. And for now, I'll invite our third speaker, that's Professor Roger Alford who's also a professor at the Notre Dame Law School. Uh, he also, you might know him for, as a, the general editor of the Clover Ar Arbitration blog. And he has worked as a deputy assistant attorney general for international affairs with the antitrust division of the DOJ, the US DOJ. And has, after that, has returned to Notre Dame Law School. Uh, thank you, professor. It's great to hear from you. Thank you so much, Mateus, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I have been to Brazil before for, uh, on behalf of Notre Dame in I think the summer of 2017, but this is my uh, second time to do a, an event with Notre Dame Brazil. So thank you so much, uh, Mateus and, and Teus for the, and Felicia for the opportunity to, to speak to all of you about the issues of investment arbitration. And of course, uh, always thrilled to be on a panel with Krina and Sadie Blanchard, uh, just wonderful colleagues and friends. And uh, so I'm thrilled to be on a panel with them. So I'm gonna talk about um, an issue that is ever present in all of our minds. And that is uh, the issue of how the uh, world of the pandemic is going to change uh, the way we do work going forward. And so specifically the topic is, everyone is talking about, will the office ever be the same after the pandemic? Uh, and I think everyone is thinking the same thing about 
international arbitration and, and including investment arbitration will investment arbitration be the same after the pandemic uh, and so let me just give a few thoughts about that there's been a lot of creativity uh, in the past year with respect to topic of virtual hearings and whether or not virtual hearings are a temporary uh, experiment that has happened as a, as a result of the necessity of the pandemic, or are they potentially going to be a permanent feature of uh, international arbitration, including investment arbitration? Um, and so I think all of us can resonate with the sort of advantages and disadvantages of, of having Zoom meetings and Zoom conferences and Zoom classes. And there's a whole range of feelings, I think, about that issue. Uh, unlike teaching, uh, where I think there's uniform perspective that everything in person is better, almost always, uh, and as soon as we possibly can get back to in-person teaching, I think with respect to the globalized business of international arbitration, I think there's very mixed feelings about whether or not everything should go exactly back to how it was before the pandemic. And so that's the topic I want to talk about today. I want, I want to talk about the way the different arbitration institutions have responded to the issue of virtual hearings. Um, I should say that I've, I'm going to focus my attention on virtual hearings. It's long been the practice for years and years that there's been electronic case management, um, that, that pleadings and filings have, have been uploaded onto electronic databases, uh, that, that preliminary conference meetings with arbitrators and counsel have been happened by audio or by video. Uh, but what is really, I think, uh, the salient issue for today is whether or not the actual hearings should be moved permanently to the virtual world instead of the in-person uh, in, in, in person hearings. Um, in the early months of the pandemic, a number of arbitration institutions uh, issued statements and guidelines and proposals for how they're going to be doing virtual hearings. Uh, I think over 13 arbitration institutions uh, issued such guidelines or letters, including ICSID for the investment arbitration in March of 2020, uh, as well as the ICC and, and, and the Singapore International Arbitration Center, a whole variety of different institutions. Uh, among the more noteworthy ones is the, and you can look this up on the internet, the 2020 Seoul Protocol on Video Conferencing and International Arbitration, 2020 Seoul, uh, Seoul Korea protocol on video conferencing and international arbitration. And they issue, they dealt with a whole range of, of issues to sort of think about how virtual hearings should be conducted. Um, it's particularly relevant in the world of investment arbitration because investment arbitration, as uh, Professor Blanchard mentioned, is incredibly expensive uh, and time consuming. The average investment arbitration costs $10 million and the average length of an investment arbitration is approximately four years. So you have four years and $10 million of litigation expense associated with investment arbitration. And so it's become a common criticism. Uh, unlike commercial arbitration, where it's commonly said that it's fast, it's less expensive, uh, investment arbitration, everyone recognizes that one of the major downsides of uh, taking this path is that it's extraordinarily expensive and it's very, very slow. So can virtual hearings to some degree or another facilitate some of those, addressing some of those concerns? So I'm gonna just propose a few thoughts on virtual hearings and the pros and cons of virtual hearings and how it might be applied. And I would imagine that um, the issues about virtual hearings are gonna be more relevant to lawyers in Brazil probably than lawyers in the United States because after all, uh, anyone that has experienced those flights, 13 and a half hour flights from Chicago to Sao Paulo knows just how incredibly exhausting it is to constantly be traveling to Europe or to North America to, you know, conduct hearings. You know, I can only think that probably the, the Australians feel more passionate about this issue probably than it would be the only other country than the Brazilians uh, because you're always having to be on a flight and it's not just any flight, it's an entire day each way that you're losing. So it is a significant cost of actually traveling to Europe or traveling to North America to engage in a hearing. And, and is it really worth that if there are viable alternatives? So let me just talk about a few of the pros and a few of the cons with respect to virtual hearings. Um, obviously, um, one of the key questions is whether or not it's cheaper 
in the long term to do virtual hearings. You don't have to do the travel expenses, not only for you as counsel, uh, but also for the arbitrators. And that includes the incredible cost associated with renting out the hearing space, uh, the hotel space, the long blocks of time that you have to commit um, to, to doing a hearing. So there is this, I think, a very, very recognized sense that virtual hearings, uh, in terms of just the sheer transaction costs are cheaper than, uh, than all of the costs associated with, with in-person hearings. It's obviously more convenient to do virtual hearings. Um, you know, you can be anywhere in the world and you can zoom on without, with relative ease. Uh, and it's, it's extraordinarily easy to, and to, to, to have the convenience of, of virtual hearings. So the convenience is fairly obvious. Um, in addition to that, um, you uh, avoid delays. Uh, arbitrators that are at the top of their game are incredibly busy and their schedules are blocked out months and months in advance. Um, and with virtual hearings, there is now the opportunity to not have one giant block of, you know, one week or two week of hearings, but rather have, um, you know, a couple days here and then you wait a week and do, and do a couple days somewhere at a, at a, in a future week and then you have another two days. Um, you know, three weeks down the road, there's no inherent reason with virtual hearings that you have to do it all at one time. The, the sort of single block hearings that you do, you know, case in chief, and then the response and all of the, uh, all of the major presentations happening in one block of time, it's incredibly hard to get three extraordinarily prominent arbitrators to agree on their schedules in a way that is convenient. And therefore you sometimes simply are delayed by months just for scheduling purposes. Whereas with virtual hearings, you can obviously uh, find windows of opportunity where there's a day or two here and there that the arbitrators are all available. And there, therefore you can go faster in terms of scheduling of the hearings. Um, so those are all, I think, fairly obvious advantages to virtual hearings. And I think that everyone is recognizing them now that we've been doing them now for uh, almost a year. Um, there are though, downsides. There are significant downsides to virtual hearings that I think people are talking about. Um, one of the most obvious ones uh, is with respect to time zones. So, um, you know, if you've ever tried to do phone calls or Zoom calls with people in Singapore or in Australia or New Zealand, it seems like um, 8 a.m. Eastern is about the only hour that is convenient for almost everyone. And even that's not convenient for everyone because there are some people that have to be on the call at one and two in the morning. But generally speaking, 8 a.m. in the morning is great for the Northern, Northern and Southern hemispheres for Europe and for parts of Asia. And that's about it. There's like one hour that's like relatively convenient for everybody. Um, uh, and so you have to figure out time zones. And what that means in practice in reality is someone is at a disadvantage, right? Is, is it fair to the party that's doing the hearing at 10 p.m. their time to be going against someone that's doing it at 9 a.m. On the, on the other side, right? And, and, and if you do do a hearing with time zones like that, um, can you do it for more than like two or three hours and, and ask one side to, to, to do a presentation at one in the morning? Uh, so time zones, I think, are an issue that have to be considered. Uh, you just simply cannot do that many blocks of time within a given day, given those time zone difficulties. Technology issues um, are unfortunately a big issue. Uh, a lot of people are just not super comfortable with technology. There are always glitches of different types. Uh, I was at a hearing yesterday where they had, uh, this was not a, it was in federal court, but they were trying to do Zoom presentations by, by from, uh, from state's attorney generals around the country and literally the, the technology wasn't working. Like a brand new courthouse, you know, in Dallas, Texas, and, you know, state's attorneys general from Utah couldn't zoom in, right? Because they could, we could see them, but we couldn't hear them, right? And that was just unbelievably ridiculous that you have a hearing and you have most, the most basic of technology issues uh, that happen. A third major downside that is uh, of concern is the risk of, uh, of security. Uh, cybersecurity or hacking. Uh, these are very, very sensitive confidential information that are being shared in these hearings. Uh, and the risk of cybersecurity or hacking or some sort of uh, sensitive issues being uh, available for, um, for 
inter interruption or interception by parties, I think is, is very significant and has to be considered. Um, a fourth issue that's, I think, problematic with virtual hearings is witness examination. Uh, the, 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 there's a debate out there. It's not, there's not an agreement, but there is a debate about whether or not you can effectively cross-examine a witness or, or do a, a witness in chief uh, through a virtual hearing. Is it the same uh, to do it uh, where you're actually asking questions of a witness or doing cross-examination of a witness, doing it virtually? Um, and that, so A, can you do it as effectively as you normally would? And B, uh, is there someone off screen that is coaching the person as they're doing the witness? So there's very often uh, witness examination where there's multiple cameras in the room so that you can both see the person that's being examined, but also see the entire room 360 to make sure that no one is coaching them as they do their presentation. So witness examination is a big issue. Um, there are some people that say it can be incredibly effective, that it's, it's, it's useful, that you can very easily do, you know, uh, sharing of documents on the screen to to see it. So it's not a, a uniform agreement that it's less effective, but there is a debate about whether or not it is as effective. And then the, the fifth thing I would say in terms of the downsides of virtual hearings is the intangible um, aspect of, uh, you know, it's the way I talk about Zoom, it's like all business all the time, right? We never like, what do we do when we, when we leave the meeting, right? We, we push the little red button in the bottom of our screen and then we go to our separate ways and we don't even have a chit chat in the hallway or in the conference room or reception. It's all business all the time, right? And so the intangible uh, benefits of the rapport that you develop, the, the um, emotional connection that you have with, with the arbitrators or with the, other, with the other council that might lead to settlement, it's just not there. I mean, we all feel like that, that incredible pain of absence of the social interactions that happen because of Zoom. And that's clearly the case uh, with hearings. There's simply not the opportunity for the intangible elements associated with uh, being there in person. And so uh, I think that's felt very deeply by people in terms of, of uh, a downside with respect to virtual hearings. So. Uh, I could say a lot more about it. I think the, the, the jury is out about how common they will be going forward, but I think it's something that everyone is thinking about intensely because of what's happened over the past year. Thank you, Professor Alford, for the great speech. And since we have a, a few minutes before closing, uh, I have some questions. I think Professor Blanchard also said she had a question, see if she, she wants to put it forward, but I have some questions. And if anyone also ha has a question and wishes to submit it, you can use the key way button at the bottom of the screen. And if we have the time, we, we will read and ask the questions to, to the professors. But if I might start with the first question, uh, one of, uh, I put this question to all our speakers, the Professor Baltag mentioned the, the Brazilian model that's different from, from the BITs that have a very different, uh, they have a dispute resolution clause and arbitration clause, but mostly folks at state to state arbitrations. And this seems to re resonate with Professor Blanchard's speech about this growing skepticism about investor state arbitration. So I, I'll ask the professors if they think it possible for maybe in the UNCITRO reform or maybe the countries creating other models to see a departure from the standard BIT investor state arbitration model to other dispute resolution models in the future, in the near future. Well, I, I'll, I'll take the floor first, uh, um, and um, if if I may, I, I I think what is important to highlight, and uh, and I really appreciate it, say these comments, uh, uh, and in particular the fact that she mentioned that each state should decide what is best. Uh, I think that's that's important, and also stressed during the UNCTRA working group free discussions 
uh, US in particular, Russia, uh, they all mentioned uh, the advantages of having this bilateral um, settings or frameworks because uh, each state in relation to a specific uh, an other state, they have particular needs and priorities. Um, and also what is important to mention is that the investors in states should have options. Uh, the fact that we're going to implement, for example, a, a different uh, dispute resolution mechanisms should not exclude the more traditional ones. Uh, and if we refer to uh, Brazil, uh, I, was, I was mentioning that Brazil has the arbitration law um, from 1996. Um, and uh, what is more important that in the 2015 amendment, uh, the, 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 the law, um, let's say, established that the public administration, administração pública direta e indireta, they can, they, can, uh, they, they, they can be part in, the, in, an, arbit part in an arbitration agreement. Uh, so what, what I think it's important is to uh, make sure that investors have options and investors feel they have the protection they should have whenever going in a particular jurisdiction. Um, and uh, if you look at the UNCITRAL Working Group free discussions, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, quite consensus on the fact that mediation and other alternative dispute resolution, so uh, prevention mechanisms should be put in place and encouraged by the states. Um, as long as we have options and options are out there, I think there is no harm in having a new uh, mechanisms like the Multilateral Investment Court or the Ombudsman or the Joint Committee in, in the Brazilian agreements. I agree and I don't want to say too much more because I want to allow time for more questions if people have them. Okay, let's see the on the question here. So uh, another question, again, based on but not limited in this Brazilian model, not limited to this Brazilian model, is the, the, this possibility of state-to-state -state international arbitration uh, because of, of the issue arising from these investment treaties. Uh, because usually when you think of the usual model of investor state arbitration, you think of, uh, I think as Professor Alford mentioned, of, and Professor mentioned, of damages award, very, very large damages awards. And having an international award would facilitate enforcement because even if the government itself is reluctant to enforce, but you could enforce it in many jurisdictions and stuff like that. But if you have a state-to-state -state arbitration, uh, do you do you any of the professors think that there might be a hurdle? It might be more difficult to to enforce awards in these arbitrations since they're probably not going to be damages awards, but going to be something I don't know, maybe injunctive awards or declaratory awards since the, they're going to, to relate to state-to-state -state disputes or they're going to, to, to be more, more likely diplomatically enforced? State-to-state uh, -state enforcement issues are real. They are uh, common problems. Um, you can see, for example, dispute between the Philippines and China about uh, with respect to the China Sea and, and, and whether or not China will respect the arbitration decisions. China basically has just completely and totally ignored the decision with respect to, um, to the, the Philippines won on almost all counts with respect to that case and China has just ignored it completely. So I do think that it is a risk. Um, on, as a general rule though, I think that states do comply with uh, arbitration awards, it, there's reputational consequences of failing to comply. And so, you know, prior to the investment of the create the invention of investment state arbitration, you know, diplomatic espousal of claims was the norm. And, th and that is what happened typically under um, freedom commerce navigation treaties. And so it's certainly not a new question. It's an, it's an old issue. 
Uh, my impression generally, and I'd, I'd welcome uh, the other panelists' views on this, but generally is that state-to-state -state enforcement is usually successful and that generally speaking, there are reputational consequences that states want to avoid and therefore they try to comply. I agree that the reputational um, cost of not complying can, it works um, sometimes. Um, obviously it doesn't work all the time, but neither does enforcement of arbitration awards work all the time. Um, even if you work, if you had no problem, um, um, like if it was a damages award, for example, and not a sort of specific performance as Matthias was thinking, um, and you got into court and you, and, and on an enforcement proceeding against a state, um, even, and even in, a, in an investor state arbitration, there are, there are difficulties forcing a state to pay in, in a lot of cases because they can move their assets around. Um, they can make sure that they're not putting them in places where, um, where an investor would be able to get their hands on them. Um, right, so there, there are enforcement weaknesses even in the, the sort of current traditional model. Uh, it's hard to know uh, whether it would be better or worse um, on the enforcement end in the state-to-state -state situation. Okay, well, I don't think we have any more questions from our from my side and from the um, from the viewers. So I don't know if Professor Blanchard will want to ask that question. She said she had to regard yeah. Professor Balta. Yeah, so my question was in Brazil. So I understand that Brazil hasn't entered into any investment treaties that provide for investor state arbitration, but does the government um, enter into commercial arbitration um, agreements um, in its concession contracts, for example, uh, in on, in the international um, field, not in, in, in domestic arbitration or, or either. So, so that, that's an excellent question. And I was referring early, earlier about the Arbitration Act, uh, which, which um, uh, also an interesting uh, point uh, with the Arbi Brazilian Arbitration Act is that uh, although it was enacted in 1996, in 2001, the, the, uh, the constitutional court so ha had to assess the constitutionality of the Arbitration Act uh, and, 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 you can set, and you can see here why in 2002, we had the accession to the ratification of the New York Convention. So we can, we can start saying that arbitration in Brazil started to develop after 2001. So it's quite a, quite a young uh, jurisdiction, if you, if you put, put it so. But the, but the, the practice started evolving and, and it's it was interesting to see even before the amendment of 2015 Arbitration Act, that special laws they started providing for uh, arbitration with, uh, with public entities. And for example, and without taking the constitution, which is a, which is a very interesting uh, piece of legislation that one, one should read that guarantees obviously the private property, refers to the expropriation for public purposes, uh, and also that encourages investments and reinvestments uh, different laws such as the public contracts law uh, provided for arbitration. And that was meant specifically to attract foreign investments. So even, even before the amendments of the Brazilian Arbitration Act, but now with the, with the new version of the Brazilian Arbitration Act, we have, uh, we have this express provision providing for um, uh, arbitrability of disputes with public administration uh, and as I said, it's uh, direct and indirect public administration. So ministries, uh, for example, direct uh, public administration. So without the distinct legal personality from the state and also indirect public administration like state owned entities. So quite a broad spectrum. Uh, and also based on this several special laws starting to be updated or, or enacted providing for arbitration, for example, and I think the most important, the public concession law, the pr public private partnership law. So yes, the answer is, uh, I, I believe that it's one of the, Brazil is one of the few jurisdictions that has this generous arbitration approach to arbit arbitrating with, uh, with public entities. And 
part of BFI Maya. There's there's actually a, a recent interesting case uh, that of a contract that was that was entered into by the government. It's a concession contract report that was entered into by the government in the 40s. So well, a lot before we had this arbitration all of these new laws, but which had an arbitration clause. And the, the concession finished recently. And there, there is currently uh, one company is, has a, uh, filed a motion to, to compel the government to, to arbitration based on this contract that was entered into the 40s. And the, and we we saw this case, we studied it a little, and the interesting thing that even though this contract was very very old, but the, these recent development that that Professor Baltak highlighted now were truly what allowed the this the arbitration clause to be valid, uh, and this it's probably going to be a a landmark case that might. Uh, even prove to be a benchmark for uh, for even for investors who, who are considering entering into a contract with the Brazilian government who which has a, an arbitration clause because it's probably going to be one of the one of the main cases of this kind in the currently. So we don't have any any more questions. So. I want to to thank to 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 say our thanks to all the professors. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time to to talk to this audience and to to share your knowledge with us. It has been a a great talk, and uh, I can say that I learned a lot here, and I, I our audience will probably agree. And I also want to say, if you want to have a lot more of these talks that we we're having right now, you can, if you want, you should only apply to the Notre Dame LLM program. It was one of the best decisions I, I've taken in my life. I had the opportunity to meet Professor Blanchard, Professor Alford, and a lot of other great professors. As Dr. Caponigri mentioned before, uh, the LLM has opened some new concentrations. So even if investment arbitration is not your thing, it's not my main subject either, but we have, the program has concentrations in US private law for people who want to take the bar exam and work in the US. They have concentrations in IP law and, and business law and many interesting programs. So you should check the website and you should apply because, because it's, it's a great place to be, a great place to learn. And I personally recommend it to anyone who, who's interested. And thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mateus. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone.